with him Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy to see you here. We are going to talk about Hungary today, the politics of memory. Now, I'm a visual historian, and that's why images came to my mind right away. And I picked three pictures in order to get us into the topic. And they are closely linked to what our panelists are dealing with professionally. And if these pictures are wrong, please tell me. But I'm pretty sure these pictures are adequate. Let's look at the first one. You see a living ephemeral erweiterten Sinn an einem symbolischen Ort in Budapest. Monument here. It's a monument, a memorial in the broader sense. It's located at a symbolic place in Budapest. Human beings are using their bodies in order to form the symbol of love, a heart. And this is their comment concerning the dominant political messages of the recent past, which were characterized by mistrust and rejection and exclusion. The law, the parliament had adopted a law obliging NGOs to disclose foreign funding, allegedly foreign funding. And this was an attempt made to undermine their independence. This law passed by the Hungarian parliament was closely connected to the so-called Lex CEU. That's the law pertaining to the independent university in Hungary, i.e., a contested review and revision of the university law according to which the CEU could no longer work in Hungary. The university had been funded by George Soros, who was the founder of the university and who had also sponsored numerous NGOs with his Open Society Foundations. He is the enemy number one of the Hungarian government. Right now, the government is planning another national consultation concerning his work. Andrea Pito is teaching at the CEO, CEU. She is a professor for gender studies. And thus, as you can see, we are focusing on the broader context of the questions, questions we are pondering today, i.e., academic freedom, the civil society, and liberal values. Professor Petu studied history and sociology in Budapest, and she has undertaken numerous studies for the Eötvös University and the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. She has been interested in gender studies for a long time. She also focused on Julia Radic, who fought for the right memory of her husband, who had been executed after an alleged tri trial. The challenges of the cultural and communication memory is a topic Peto has also pondered in the context of the European history, the Holocaust, or the Trianon Peace Treaty. Since the 1990s, she's been a professor at the CEU. She's also teaching at the Budapest Eötvös University and the University of Miskolc. Das Denkmal für die Opfer der deutschen Besatzung. 
the monument for the victims of the German occupation, an eagle representing Nazi Germany, an archangel, Gabriel, the protection patron of Hungary. This is what you see in this picture and in this monument together with the year 1944, so that you know what is being shown and when it happened. Now, this monument triggered a controversy, and people discussed, A, the design aspect, because the very symbolism of the monuments is showing Hungary as a whole, which becomes, as a whole, a victim of the Nazis in spite of the fact that the two countries were allies during World War II, which means a victimization of Hungary and thus the fact that there were Jewish victims of the Holocaust, 400,000 all in all, is not being shown. And the responsibility of Hungary for the deportations is hidden too. The second criticism concerns the realization of the monument, because the government only needed a few weeks in order to express its wish that there be such a monument and in order to finalize the design. There was a lot of protest manifest in open letters, press statements, demonstrations, and the establishment of the 11 MEQMU project. This monument makes me speak about Eva Kovac. She is a sociologist, a doctor of sociology. She obtained her doctor's title with a project dealing with the Jewish identity in Slovakia between the two world wars. She became a professor in 2009. She is a lecturer at the Economic University and the Eyjot University in Budapest and at the Danus Pannonius University in Pitch. She has dealt with the fight for the memory or the combat for the memory for many years. This is also one of the titles of her text dealing with the core themes of the politics of memory. She has focused on relevant events in Hungary during the 20th century. She's also written a number of essays about the ambivalences of the Holocaust Memorial Year 2014. And she has asked, what are the challenges for the Holocaust Memorial in Hungary and for memorizing and remembering the Holocaust in the country? Now, this is the old and the new Kossuth um, monument, which is, so to speak, a condensation of different historical epochs and competing interpretations of the time. This is a statue that tells us something about the revolution of 1849 and 1848 and a haughty regime, socialism, and Orban's system of national collaboration, the NER. You see Lajos Kossuth, the revolutionary, and the members of the first government. The idea to erect such a monument came up after Kossuth's death. Due to World War I, it was only possible to erect it, however, in 1927. After, in 1945, the communist regime thought that this work was much too pessimistic. They removed it, and they replaced it by a more hero-like representation of Koshu. The socialist statue was now removed by the NER, and replaced by a reproduction of the old Kossuth monument, which is what you see on the photograph. The monument modification is to be seen in the context of the redesign of the Kossuth Square in front of the parliament. The 
government was inspired by the design of the square in 1944. Joachim von Puttkamer is a connoisseur of the history of Central and Eastern Europe in the 19th and 20th century. He has pondered extensively questions like state building, nationalism, and competing cultures of memory. This has been in the focus of re his research for many years. The city of Freiburg has always been an important issue in Mr. von Badgammer's work. This is where he obtained his doctor's title in the early 1990s, and he also became a professor. And he published his study, Everyday Life at Schools and the National Integration in Hungary. In addition to the patriotic education in the 19th century, Putkama focused also on legal aspects related with the communist dictatorship in Poland, the system change in Hungary in 1989 and in Poland, and the unofficial encounters of socialist citizens between 1956 and 1989. Since 2002, he's been a professor for Eastern European history at the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena, and he's also been the director of the Imre Kurtisch College European East in the 20th century since 2010. Thank you very much. Wir, genau, wir wechseln jetzt hier zu den Tischen. And let's move over now to the introductions by the panelists. I would like to ask. No, I, I won't ask a question because I thought it might make sense to have the three panelists introduce themselves and their topics today. Thank you very much for the invitation. Those who don't understand what I'm saying, please pick up your headphones. Uh, I'm extremely happy to be here. And uh, when we met uh, yesterday with Joachim, we were wondering how long we have known each other. And it's actually 30 years, because I had the privilege to take courses with Professor Schramm and uh, uh, Stefan Plagenborg in Freiburg. And my German is the same as uh, human rights and gender equality in Eastern Europe. You believe that it is actually you know, increasing, but it's decreasing. So my presentation will be in uh, English. Please excuse me. I'm sorry for this. And uh, just a tiny footnote that uh, uh, actually I'm a professor. Uh, so and actually, you know, t I, this is, um, how to say, um, I've got two professorships, one in Hungarian. Uh, so the president of Hungary actually you know, shook my hand and uh, gave this title, and also the uh, Central European University. So, uh, and this is actually important because there are very few female professors, and also I have the title of the Doctor of Academy of Sciences, which 7% of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences are women. So just let me stress that uh, this is an achievement, and uh, I find this important always to stress, especially because I see so many young women in the audience in this unholy hour. Thank you very much again for coming. Uh, so let me start by um, thanking um, for your support for CU. Uh, it's not over. Actually, you know, we are at the same position where we were before. Uh, so if you have got any particular questions, I would be happy to respond. Uh, I particularly found important the support what CU received from the Hungarian colleagues because uh, that's not so easy and it's full of risks. Um, but at the moment, we are hoping that uh, this agreement will be signed and CEU will stay in Hungary. Um, what I would like to talk about in the remaining um, uh, seven minutes is actually about the popularization of history and the populist threat to history. Uh, yesterday, we had in this uh, roundtable discussion some talks about, you know, this unholy history and the fake history coming up. So uh, this popularization of memory, which is um, um, 
all over in uh, Europe uh, is basically one of the main challenges for historians as a profession and also for political activists and political uh, activity. And I would like to start from this, uh, the preamble of the European Constitution, which is saying, believing that Europe reunited after bitter experiences intends to continue along the path of civilization. And I would like to stress this term, bitter experience, which is used in the European Constitution as a euphemism for genocide, Holocaust, forced settlement, and um, the dark legacy of Europe. And I'm actually arguing that this dark legacy is coming back. And the relevance of my presentation are basically three points. I was instructed to make a very simple PowerPoint because some of you, uh, you speak English as shaky as my German. So uh, first is that there is a major challenge of the post-1945 anti-fascist global consensus. And you can bring in lots of examples, starting from the new uh, Holocaust Museum uh, in Canada, where they accidentally omitted Jews as victims of the Holocaust, uh, till this monument, which was mentioned in the introduction. The emergence of fake history, that there is a new institutional structure being built out in Eastern Europe, producing a different type of history. And the third one, which is, of course, closest to my heart, is this anti-gender mobilization, uh, which is using gender as a mobilizational category, uh, which, according to my definition, is a hegemonic fight for control via redefinition of human rights and neoliberal representative democracy. So it's a hegemonic fight. So that's why in the pre yesterday in the evening session they were talking about backlash. I don't think it's a backlash. My argument is that it's a new form of governance and um, which will redefine uh, uh, human rights and neoliberal representative democracy, creating new cleavages cutting through political parties, and using language of hate. So in my profession, we are basically labeled as gender mafia, gender fascist, gender ideology, who are representing the culture of death. And my argument is that basically this is the part of the same global hegemonic fight, where memory politics is also important. Uh, and this is my main argument for the talk that uh, successful memory politics, and we have seen several examples yesterday and we will see today, uh, will transform the collective memory. And the liberal ideology, the illiberal state, can eliminate the earlier influence of liberalism and establish its own hegemonic neoliberalism. So basically, my argument is that there is no backlash, but there is a hegemonic fight which might actually you know, create a new hegemonic neoliberal memory system, which is based on uh, exclusion and uh, using the language of hate and emotions like exclusion and, and hate. And in order to substantiate this argument, I'm actually using for um, a theoretical concept of revisionism uh, and an example of Museum of Trianon to explain this particular uh, argument and claim what I'm actually bringing in. Uh, for historical revisionism, revisionism has got this very bad connotation. You have got this red flag immediately going up when you are talking about revisionism. Um, but I find this typology of Tucker extremely useful, understanding um, revisionism, and he's speaking about three types of revisionisms. Uh, the significance driven, when there is a change in what historians find uh, significant, evidence driven, like for example, they uh, discover that the uh, Viking warrior actually is a woman and not a man, so I mean, that's a pretty good evidence uh, to reconceptualize about the Viking society. Or value-driven, when historical events and processes are re-evaluated due to a new system of values becoming hegemonic. And if you look at these three types of revisionisms, you immediately think that the new humanism, including my profession, gender studies, women's studies, is actually a revisionist 
study, right? A revisionist discipline. So it will be extremely difficult to draw the line, right? That this is good revisionism and that is bad revisionism. And I would like to bring in the example of the Museum of Trianon in Varpalota, uh, which you see in these pictures is a pretty big palace by the Zici uh, family. Uh, this is an expert audience, but I suppose some of you don't know what Trianon is. This is the peace treaty uh, after the uh, First World War when Hungary lost two thirds of its territory. And this is a uh, chart from the museum webpage. And uh, there are some pictures from the Museum of Trianon, um, which already indicates that the museology is rather from the 1970s or 80s but still it's always full. I'm, I'm one of those who very often visiting this museum. And you see this kind of uh, representation uh, which is really going back to the 1970s and the visual uh, visuality. And it's a big um, enterprise. You can also uh, uh, order online all these gadgets. and. Um, uh, this kind of uh, uh, museum is, um, you know, it's full of uh, visitors, unlike some of the museums we would like to see as, uh, as nice um, and uh, visitable uh, museums. And I would like to share with you some s stories about the chronology of the museum, uh, which is, um, it was, um, uh, the conservative government in 2002 uh, supported the foundation of the Trianon Museum, and it donated this castle. What you have, what you have seen here, is uh, for one foreign, one foreign. And between 2002 and 2010, when there was allegedly a leftist liberal government, this complex was actually built out based on the idea of um, uh, revising the history and creating an alternative canonized story. And uh, uh, 2007, the Hungarian Guard, which is the uh, far-right, Jobbik um, uh, paramilitary organization started to contribute and participate and send their members to the uh, Museum of Trianon. And of course, um, uh, from this point onwards, you see a kind of political uh, uh, participation and the polit politics actually entered into the field. And of course, you have got lots of arguments why you should not pay attention to the Museum of Trianon. Uh, and I listed some arguments, but I already run out of time, so I'm happy to talk about this later. But let me say that because of the performative authenticity of the museum, uh, this kind of museum, which is not only in Hungary, but in Turkey um, uh, and also in Russia, you see a different chain of um, uh, private museums growing. And this museum started by individuals, then they got foundations, and then they, the illiberal state are actually promoting this kind of museums. And now these museums are uh, becoming an important part of creating a revised story and the revisionist uh, presentation of the history. And uh, of course, you can say that you know this is professionally bad. It is bad. Uh, it is very political, and it's not an objective story. Yes, it is not an objective story. It is basically a definitional. It's full of hate and uh, and exclusion. Yes, it is full of hate and exclusion. It's very emotional. Uh, it's basically you know the positionality of the museum is unacceptable. On the other hand, I would like to argue that we should get engaged with this kind of. Uh, 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 museums and criticize and uh, discuss. And that was the uh, other uh, conclusion I, I drew from the yesterday roundtable, namely that we cannot really withdraw into our ivory tower. We have to go out and argue and uh, take part in public discussion. So if you are interested, I wrote this um, up in this, um, uh, in this paper. If you don't have access to good archive, good libraries because of neoliberal universities are not always subscribing for 
uh, different types of um, uh, databases, you can download it from my academia.edu website. Uh, on the other, so this is my argument that be, that here that um, uh, this successful memory politics is based on the revisionist structure of history, and this is this popularization of history. We cannot really say that these people are who are visiting en masse this museum; they are deplorables. Right? We cannot use this term because this is, uh, and they are, they have got false consciousness. I mean, you cannot really, you know, be in this elitistic position and say that what they are believing is not good or not correct. So that's why I put up these five points, which are actually arguing that you should not be involved in arguing and getting in, in discussion about this um, kind of very bad history why this is popular and it's extremely uh, um, effective. So my argument is basically that we should be vigilant, get out, be, participa be participants in different discussions, take the risk, and try to win the fight for values because the um, uh, different forms of revisionisms are actually happening and, you know, F drawing a fine line between what is good revisionism and what is bad revisionism is extremely difficult if the hearts and the minds of people are actually won by others. Thank you very much. So, vielen, vielen Dank uh, für die, die Thank you very much for the wonderful introduction. And of course, I like the picture and I do agree to your choice. I'm very happy to be one of the panelists and I am looking forward to our deliberations concerning the politics of memory in Hungary. I will speak German. We are dealing with a phenomenon we have been dealing with for a long time already, and we call it the politics of memory. And actually, it's uh, characterized by the fact that there is not much new under the sun. I would like to show you pictures in order to give you examples. And I will also offer some questions we can ponder together. Now, the first picture you see is a carpet. You might remember, or maybe not, that in 2010 or 2011, Hungary had the EU presidency, and the country offered a 202 square meter big carpet for the lobby of the European Parliament. Now, this carpet was shown at the Parliament premises, and it represents the most important icons of um, the Hungarian history. In the center of the carpet, you see a map. And this map dates from 1848, they say, but it shows Greater Hungary, i.e. this gets us to the Trianon right away. And of course, there was a major reaction triggered in the European Parliament. People said this is a historical and apparently the values shared by Hungary are different from the values in the EU. What shall we do was the question. However, in Brussels, they overlooked 
that at the time already there had been thousands of Trianon monuments in Hungary with the double cross. The double cross, the mythological bird to roll, and the greater Hungary map. The second example I would like to mention is again reminding us of the mythology of the Hungarian history, which is not only the Holocaust or the revolt of 1956, it's also the Trianon, which has always been important in the Hungarian politics of history. And a second example reminds us that there has always been a ambivalence in the Hungarian history, especially with respect to the long durée. And I would like to therefore mention the Holocaust. We have a number of unopened, uninaugurated or invisible museums and memorials in Hungary. We do have the Holocaust Documentation Center in the capital. And this documentation center has played a role in our education. And yet, a number of controversies, controversies have been involved. Even before the documentary center was opened, it had triggered a number of controversies with respect to the building, with respect to the deadlines and the date of the inauguration, and also with respect to its very design and aesthetics and its location. Why is it located in the margins of um, the city? And why do we have to represent our own Holocaust in view of the fact that there is the uh, Holocaust Memorial in Washington in the United States. It's also been subject to criticism with respect to um, the opening of the permanent exhibition, which only took place in the year 2005, and also with respect to the directors. There had never been an open call, for example. The directors of the uh, documentary center um, had never been appointed after an open call. They had always been appointed by the government. And different from Horst Esteros, for example, school classes have never been obliged to visit the documentary center when teachers go to Budapest with their students, with their pupils, they get a government sponsoring for uh, visits to other museums, but they don't get um, sponsored visits to the Holocaust Museum. A few years later, another museum was built, the so-called House of Destiny. The building as such was uh, erected three years ago, but uh, the museum has never been open. Nobody knows what's going to happen there. Another example I would like to briefly mention is involving the aspect of self-victimization. As you can see on the picture, there is, so to speak, the the narrative in stone erected by the government, which is an initiative of the Living Monument Initiative. It has been mentioned before. It's a living memorial, so people go there and leave items on the spot in order to Remember, 
the Hungarian history, but the aspect of victimization is very powerful here. And victimization has always been an important aspect in the Hungarian politics of memory. Now, the last example I would like to mention is, of course, concerning the revolution of 1956. In summary, we could go and say this is history rewritten or retouched. We also saw examples from Poland yesterday. This is, for example, for us, the icon of um, the Peste Bursche, a narrative which starts at an early stage. And there is also um, a website a right-wing extremist website which has been online for many years for the Peste Razze, which has underlined the fact that this is not about the great martyrs only. It's also about the ordinary men who were involved in the revolution. Now, the problem is these are armed young people. I mean, this is 2017, and these are armed teenagers, and they are considered icons. That's the problem, I'd say. And as we heard yesterday, this is about fighting for the hegemony. And it's dangerous, I think. Now, each narrative has its counter narrative. The House of Terror, for example, has um, shown an exhibition where all communist elements of the revolution were removed. And all aspects which are not interesting for the Orban government were removed as well. And the government also added items to the exhibition. They used the same design so that people thought it was part of the original exhibition. These three examples were meant to underline once again that the icons on the particular approach with respect to the politics of memory are not new. This is not a phenomenon of the last 20 years, since 1948, no, that, sorry, since 1848, actually, you have this particular approach. And we always have to see the Hungarian politics of memory in its foreign policy context. It's never been an autochthonous, purely domestic approach. The fact that Hungary thinks it's a victim first and foremost has a foreign policy dimension. And especially after international conflicts and quarrels, Hungary goes and reminds other nations of this particular fact, i.e., that it has always been an, a victim. This was an item in the past, and it's still an item on the agenda today with respect to the EU policy. So we are dealing with a phenomenon which is not known socio sociologically spoken, it means that we have to see the elite approach with respect to historiography, and we need to understand why the elites we see today use this particular politics of history. In spite of 
uh, progressive societal developments in the past. Today, we don't see any progress anymore. Today, we are seeing insecurity and regression. Now, my question is also to you. Why do we have the positive impact of a politics of memory, i.e., the democratizing aspect? And why do we have the slowdown by politics of memory in other epochs? Thank you. Vielen Dank für die Einladung. Ich mache das von hier, damit wir allmählich auch wieder in den. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll be sitting here so that we slide into the mode of uh, panel discussion. Frank uh, Bursch pointed out um, just uh, briefly yesterday that uh, that in Hungary, Horty was uh, viewed to be an excellent uh, um, uh, uh, head of uh, state by Viktor Orban. I, I checked that, double checked that. And um, so that nobody um, complains that I'm uh, informing uh, uh, with the wrong media, I looked at the website of the Prime Minister proper and will give you a better uh, uh, view of the of that, uh, of that address where Viktor Orban uh, uh, inaugurated Palais Klebelsberg here, this, this building uh, this year, because uh, when you look at this inaugural speech, uh, he, he was using this this term. Um, that uh, well, this speech is uh, basically what Eva uh, Karvich was saying is nothing new under the sun. It is uh, the, 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 the 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 basic uh, uh, theme of uh, c um, current uh, Hungarian policy is is reflected there. Kuno Klebelsberg was Minister of Culture in the 20s, in the 1920s, I guess. Uh, and Orban says uh, in the beginning some in, in nice words, uh, culture is an important uh, resource, and he uh, talks about the um, uh, period between the two, uh, the 20th and the 30th of the 20th century, where a, a heavy hurdle for uh, the uh, Hungarianism, the, the, uh, the history um, uh, has not uh, buried uh, us, um, uh, is owed to um, people like Horty, the Prime Minister, uh, Betlin, and uh, Cultural Minister Klebesberg, uh, because without these uh, protectors, there would not have been a Prime Minister, and without that, no Cultural Minister. And, uh, and I like to quote, this fact cannot question the sad role of Hungary during the Second World War. Uh, it sounds a bit stubborn, uh, uh, um, this formulation here, this wording, the sad role of Hungary during the Second World War. There's something where we don't need to talk about it, uh, so it can be just simply ticked off. Uh, and it is uh, a clear um, move uh, towards getting to successfully uh, uh, appraise Horty. Um, it's because it could have also talked about the cultural policies of the 1920s and 1930s without uh, uh, needing to honor a haughty as an uh, exemplary um, statesman. Um, and uh, and also, uh, there is no mention of the white terror vis-a-vis um, uh, uh, -vis the red terror. And no mention of the Holocaust in that first package uh, passage already. It is clear that um, history is viewed to be a a, um, a, a test vis-a-vis -vis, uh, these these challenges, and and, and the heaviest uh, test was somehow. Um, uh, Successfully, and then he also talks about Klebisberg. He was a exemplary figure of uh, cultural uh, Hungarian history, and it was uh, a shame that his uh, 
house uh, laid in ruins for too uh, long a, a time. He was responsible for Hungarian cultural policy, where Hungary was uh, cut off from the rest of Europe uh, on account of Trion and, and lost all of its economic resources. Uh, where to get the power, where to get the will from. Uh, so this is this um, this uh, discourse of endurance here. And Klebersberg's answer was to quote uh, on uh, viable uh, uh, nations catastrophes uh, uh, um, work like when you prune a tree, you cut it back, and then it comes back uh, even more forcefully and powerfully. And such a cultural policy also needs to be uh, uh, done today. It has to be future-oriented and uh, remembering tradition. Now, you can talk about uh, Klebersberg a lot. Orban um, praised many things of it. It is a continuation of the Habsburg monarchy cultural policy, which um, sets accents in vocational training, uh, training and, uh, and also uh, uh, grammar schools so more uh, uh, natural sciences, more vocational training, also uh, strengthening uh, uh, lyces, uh, i.e. Uh, grammar schools for, for women. Uh, what is not talked about is the numerus clausus, um, binding uh, access to universities to a certain share of the population and explicitly uh, gears towards uh, a maximum of 6% uh, of Jewish students uh, uh, can get access to Hungarian schools. By the way, you can say that Klesbeck, it wasn't, wasn't his fault because uh, this law was passed before he took office. But uh, at least until 1928, he continued uh, this policy and actively uh, defended this policy until it was retreated in 1928. Now, um, and... Um, of course, you cannot expect uh, a Klebisberg seminar, but uh, this ductus, this organic renewal the, of the strong uh, sound uh, 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 roots of the nation uh, on the basis of work, work uh, is, is central to uh, Orban's speech, and uh, he prays in the cultural policy of the 20s, uh, the physical education, uh, the ideal was a productive uh, man, um, for who uh, working was active uh, uh, patriotism. And it would be most helpful if the gentleman had submitted us uh, this uh, speech, and then we could have quoted m more properly. None the <laughs> now, um, and also is uh, um, uh, uh, an attack towards European roots. Um, uh, Europe has to be exchanged, and uh, Europe has to understand the more it uh, uh, withdraws from its uh, background, um, the, the more Europe accepts that the roots are cut, uh, the less there is an opportunity to get back to the genuine Christian thought. Haughty uh, is no longer mentioned. Uh, Bethlehem uh, showed that after the shock of Trianon, a new country could be established. It, uh, strong nationality is, uh, it identity is the objective of natural policy, and that's what we have to do as well here. Uh, our cultural policy has to bring to the fore uh, affluent and educated people, and that also has to pay off. It has to be pro profitable, so to speak. That is what. Uh, annoys me most, or what uh, surprised me most, that um, that a national identity has to be something that is worthwhile and preys off, so to speak. Um, uh, what is even more scandalous than the praise of Horty is the parallel between the early 20s and uh, the present, uh, as though the accession of uh, Hungary to the EU and the current situation of the EU uh, was something that in uh, some way has to do uh, with the time after the Second World War and could be compared with this. Um, and where this threat comes from, this elementary threat comes from, from the inside and the outside, uh, is very explicit in Orban's speech. Uh, it's not explicit in his speech, and maybe, um, and is for the audience maybe clear, very clear. Um, when, of 
course, who is the threat and uh, mm -hmm. uh, remains to be discussed as well. And, and this threat is basically the only thing uh, that he presents in the uh, uh, wording of the 30s. This is all hollow um, um, stuff, uh, no content, no uh, advertising of concrete uh, uh, measures. It's just to conjure up uh, some some strange affluence. And, uh, and what is fitting is that uh, this is here not just a museum, but also a conference center, which basically has not much to do with the person of Klebelsberg. Um, uh, and we have just seen the House of the uh, uh, Destinies, uh, which is uh, empty for three years, apart from the signal that uh, it was built. Uh, you don't know how to fill it with content. So much on, on the, the uh, speech of Viktor Orban. Uh, if I have another two minutes, I would like to briefly uh, refer to yesterday's discussion in Poland. Um, because the Second World War and the Holocaust was not uh, particularly mentioned by Orban during the inauguration of this palais, uh, except for that sad role that Hungary had, and he only alluded to it uh, slightly. And also what the colleagues were saying, in the Hungarian um, uh, um, uh, uh, history populism, to uh, Hungary uh, takes the position that uh, Poland has during the Second World War a uh, traumatic uh, situation that the rest of the world can't understand, can't be understood by the rest of the world, um, uh, and which uh, uh, a reservoir of which uh, natural, national, national virtues could be uh, uh, gotten and uh, resurrected. It has an intermediate effect on what you can derive from this and what um, uh, Pictures of enemies can be derived from that. And for Poland, this situation is quite clear. There is external enemies uh, which uh, can be pulled out of uh, the box on demand, Germany or Russia. Um, if you uh, talk about Trianon, it's more difficult. Who is the enemy that has to, uh, uh, who is in charge of, of Trianon? Uh, if you look at the signatories, there is England and France, uh, Germany not. Uh, Austria, some a, a little bit, uh, but the immediate uh, uh, neighbors um, um, with who you are allies now in the, the NATO and the EU. So it is some diffuse West here that is conjured up. It's uh, the uh, internal enemy, that's the Rete Republic that is referred to here, and uh, uh, which is has a anti-communist uh, founding myths. Similar to the uh, miracle at the Weichsel, uh, which um, led to fending off the Russian army uh, and the Red Army here. Uh, and uh, the effect on the society is different. Uh, Trianon is 30 years uh, later or earlier. And if we talk about physical uh, violence, uh, we have a different category here in Hungary than in Poland, and that leads to a situation where in Hungary we have this more of a cloudy, uh, symbol-laden, unconcrete rhetoric, which r rarely um, translates into some uh, battle cry like in Poland. Because what Eva Kovac showed about uh, Pestan Polic uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, everyday life in, in Poland, where there is a militarization of youth, um, hardening of the youth, uh, 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 realizing that the next uh, war is imminent and one has to be prepared. It's more difficult in Hungary. Uh, who is to be mobilized with the Pestan Polic? maybe uh, uh, defending of uh, migrants or refugees at the border, but it is different from uh, fighting against Russian tanks. So uh, the p parallelities are, are more clear in Poland than in Hungary. So in addition to uh, um, these uh, similarities in terms of translation into the presence, there's clear differences between Hungary and Poland. And and also, anti-Semitism is much more explicit um,
because of that diffuse uh, uh, image of an enemy. You can see that in these poster campaigns uh, uh, against uh, Zorosh here, yeah, this uh, Jewish uh, conspiracy, world conspiracy. Yeah, so, oh, uh, should these differences come from? where the one or the other side uh, does not declare itself to be more or less um, lovable, say. Thank you. Und wir haben jetzt äh, viel gehört. Wir haben was über Fake History gehört, ähm, über He a Hegemonic Fight, was uns Andrea Petto vorgestellt hat. Es ging um... Now, these has, have been very interesting introductions and Dr. Petto reminded us of the parallels in the rhetorics of the governments. I've brought you a quote by Viktor Orban and concerning the memory of the year 1956, his expectations, he said, were that the memory is trendy and sexy. I mean, is that the current politics of memory? Thank you very much for the question. I'm very happy to see that we have got very different position here in the panel, because my argument is that uh, we have a fundamentally new situation. Eva is arguing that business as usual. And uh, you know, Joachim is uh, uh, presenting um, uh, a speech by Viktor Orban. I think 25 people read that, to including yourself. So, so in a sense, uh, uh, it was really worth coming to Berlin to get to know this uh, to this speech and also uh, to see that there are very different interpretations to the very similar phenomenon. And I think the bottom line here is that um, there is a major shift in rhetoric. And I would like to refer back to one of the posters Eva was um, uh, projecting about 56. And there was this huge billboard on the street. I don't know if you remember that slide. Uh, and that's a fake picture. Uh, it's a fake picture because the person who is allegedly on the picture is not on the picture, right? So this is a, basically a, a manipulated fake picture. And uh, you might ask the question that uh, why did they do this? Right, so why, what on earth? So they are not stupid. Everybody knows that, you know, this is a fake picture. Uh, it's fake not only because they photoshopped the original picture, but it's also fake because the identification of the person who is there is of course fake. And I would like you to argue that this is fundamentally a new political situation and they are basically using the politics of memory and this kind of arguments in order to create a new hegemonic memory culture and let me defend my position and then I will pass the mic to you that why this is fundamentally new because from uh, I would say 2003 or 4 not only the infrastructure of history has changed, but also the content of history teaching and also the spaces where history is being performed. So uh, the curriculum, the textbooks, uh, the uh, state television and the different uh, media <coughs> Uh, broadcasters are all supporting this kind of revisionist history. There is new historical research institute, even like the Veritas, which means truth. Uh, like in Poland, there's also um, another institute and another in, in preparation. So there is this new network of research institute, new journals, uh, popular journals, academic journals, which are actually creating a totally different infrastructure. On the other hand, you see emptiness and sleepwalking. And I'm very happy that Eva was showing this picture of um, the living memorial. We are talking about 57 people. 
So in a sense, when you are looking, um, Dr. Tip was asking about the uh, sources of resistance. Where can we find the sources of resistance? And if you are looking at these 57 people who are heroically going to the Liberty Square and trying to reconstruct this living memorial which had been destroyed by uh, thugs and um, you know other dubious characters, then the question is what would be the source of resistance? And there are no NGOs uh, there is the securitization narrative. So I would like to bring in a concept which might help us to understand this particular phenomenon when there are 57 people who are doing the living memorial. Uh, and that is the concept of the polypore state. Before you start Googling, polypore is this mushroom which lives on the trunk of the tree. And this kind of, this state this illiberal state is acting like this polypore in a sense that using the resources, ideas, which are coming from the trunk of the tree, it doesn't have ideas of its own, but it appropriates, instrumentalizes those ideas and concepts which are coming from the trunk of the tree. And it actually operates with three different concepts. One is that it actually um, mirrors, creates an alternative NGO sphere, gongos, right? These government-sponsored NGOs. So if you see millions are actually demonstrating on the streets when Viktor Orban is giving the sign that, uh, you know, this civil society needs to protect the government from Brussels, you know, all these organizations are actually mobilizing and then they are on the street. The second is the securitization narrative. So we already heard that you know there is this um, uh, unidentified danger which is there, and rationalizing that looking at who actually signed the Trianon Peace Treaty really won't help because this securitization narrative is not operating in a rational framework. It operates via hate and fear. And the third one is familialism. We are not talking about women, they are talking about families. 2018 will be the year of families. So, uh, and also if you look at the Klebelsberg cult, this is basically supported by the Klebelsberg family, the daughter of Klebelsberg who is extremely powerful, non-visible from outside, but because of this familialism, she has got excellent ties to create this conference center, which is a very vivid place for concerts and cultural events. So basically my argument is about infrastructure and about this polypore structure. And that basically has got a very negative and extremely pessimistic reading. Because no matter that the polypore illiberal state uses the resources from this tree, the stronger the tree, the polypore is the stronger, right? And therefore, I just would like to invite us to think a little bit more creatively, moving beyond this Orban bashing, and I'm very happy that Orban is really you know, such an important figure here, but thinking about the structures and really the different discourses which can be a source of resistance. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, <coughs> Ich denke, wir sind nicht so kontroversiell, wie du es jetzt, uh, jetzt... Maybe the differences between us are not that big. But it's good to, to talk about different attitudes. And for the benefit of our discussion, I just remain in the corner into which you have sent me. Now, the politics of history or the politics of memory is always an emotional thing. No doubt. And it's always about political mobilization. No doubt. That's what I expect. In the context of a memorial or a monument or a museum, I never expect a narrative of memories to be emotional. Historiography is always about selection, and it's always your choice. I mean, those who write history decide what they want to talk about 
and what they want to leave out. And I say we have, for a long time, dealing with the phenomenon because the society always wanted to have a particular um, narrative, also with respect to democracy and how to understand the future. That's, so to speak, the framework condition I see. There is a society, the society of the 21st century. Um, there is a democracy. The question is, how do we legitimize, legitimize democracy? And how do we spread it? And if there is a progressive historiography, I say it's a long durée historiography. And some elements can be used. Some elements in this history can be used in order to create a better democracy. And that's why I'm saying we've been dealing with the phenomenon for a long time. And we know what happened between the 1940s and the 1960s. There was a restrictive way of telling history, and it was hard to imagine a different future. And there was also a lot of ambivalence. And if you remember the 1950s, in Europe and in the United States, where the Holocaust was considered the progressive narrative of a democratic society. The way you told the Holocaust had an impact on the appearance of your democracy, which appeared to be more sensitive and broader. In other words, there is a certain dynamic in the long durée, and historiography is sometimes more progressive, sometimes less progressive. And the politics of memory is also sometimes more progressive and less progressive. Now, 57 people and the memorial. Of course, you can go and say it's only 57 people. But then you have the Auburn speech. And the memorial is at a central place in Budapest. I'm visiting it weekly, and there are always hundreds of tourists who go and take pictures and talk about it. So I think it's a powerful manifestation and part of the counter narrative. However, it does not make society more progressive, I think. There is another difference between us. And this refers to the structures and the iconography of the politics of memory. I say it hasn't changed much. The mythology hasn't changed much. You always have the same structures. You have the dominant narrative and the victim's narrative, and this hasn't changed much. However, it's personified today. So Soros is an anima, an enemy, the personified enemy, and that's new. We did not have this personification. We had it lost under Stalin when there was a personified national enemy. So the long line, or is it new? Now the question is, from when on would you consider it something completely new? I do agree to Eva Kovac. Politics of memory as a means of propaganda as such is not new. We've had it for 150 years. That's true. However, there is a new feature, i.e., we cannot think anymore that this particular politics of memory is made against 
the people against the population. If you look at how the regime has tried to interpret 1956, you realize that the story as such was not deeply rooted in society in the past. And the Trianon Treaty question is very much referring to the situation of Hungarian-speaking minorities, for example, in Romania and other countries. This involves the question of the double nationality, the double passport. I mean, after 1990, there were right-wing extremists who had a particular position in this field, which was not shared by conservatives. They do share it now. So this is new. Fancy, trendy, and sexy, that's the quote you mentioned. Well, we might go and say, at least it's not the victimization cult, but it means that the idea is that it's meant to be fun to deal with history. And that's a counter-narrative as such. But it's very different from a serious controversial discussion as the one we want to have here. So I do see a shift here in the very idea about how societies should work. Things are changing, not only in Hungary, I say. Kurze Frage und ich bitte um kurze Antworten. Um, Ms. Kovacs, you said that history policy and history culture can be used for democratization processes, for pushing them, for driving them. Who would be responsible for that? Who could do that? Who could uh, drive change? Um, it is. Um, there's an enormous uh, division here uh, in, in the Weimar Raum. Uh, I, I, I really feel that you are on the one side or you are on the other side. Can there be consensus? I mean, it's the same issues uh, like 20, 30, 40 years ago, but the narrative is different. There is that vision. Uh, uh, who, could there be consensus? Who could um, help establishing uh, consensus? Could it be the, uh, the pros like us? Could it be the citizens, every one of us? Or could it be the schools? Could it be the new generation? Maybe it's a generational issue. I, that's the point I didn't didn't mention earlier. Is about generation, and what we're discussing is this, the, the history of our generation, and what Joachim was mentioning: Trianon Revolution, AD no, forty-eight, and all these other myths of uh, Hungary. They all could uh, uh, take a progressive role. Uh, that's my generation, and and I do understand. Uh, and it was said yesterday already that that our liberal narrative uh, went wrong. No, it didn't. It didn't go wrong. But we ha we uh, helped build that uh, uh, democracy for good or for bad. It is not as nice as we dreamed it would turn out. But what has happened over the last twenty five years is a, a some kind of transition. Uh, this fight for a better uh, democracy. Our generation could do what it could do, and the new generations have a different uh, uh, expectation uh, to get an even better democracy. But I would like to underline, we come from communism. We come from the Qatar regime. And these myths have helped us establishing the regime change. And uh, the myths, and if some history policy can achieve that, then um, one has to say that it was progressive, that it was successful. <coughs> yeah, brief, brief answers, and then I would like to open the floor. Give a positive example. I mean, there is so much negativity and uh, criticism. So, uh, 
what can we do? So what kind of um, uh, possibilities are there? And I just would like to bring in some examples uh, which actually seem to be working, and they are done by different generation, not us who are worn out, then we have to go immediately to the retirement home. Uh, so uh, for example, memory walks. Uh, there are young uh, 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 scholars and also myself as an elderly uh, person. Uh, I'm also doing memory walks, for example, uh, feminist history of Budapest or the post-45 um, uh, transitional justice spaces. And these are actually lucrative, this is a lucrative business, so people are actually paying 10 euros to participate in these tours. And uh, then I have got like 20, 30 people, and we are, you know, talking about what happened and where are the uh, the topography of memory and also the omissions and the spaces. This is one good example. The other one, which I'm actually slightly cautiously mentioning, is financed by the Ebert Foundation in Central Europe, a discussion forum about gender equality. And the way how we are trying to create a new language, which is... Um, not you know overburdened because if you are mentioning work life balance gender mainstreaming leaky pipeline everybody falls asleep immediately so we are trying to bring in new concepts and new ideas to discuss for example love consumption uh masculinities care so those concepts which are which do not come with a heavy luggage so if you start talking about trianon you know you know you look at the person you know what kind of arguments will be coming up so it's a little bit boring so in a sense uh, uh, that's why it's really important to come up with a new language new spaces to somehow extend the discussion from the usual suspects because you know you look at your colleague and you know what the person will be saying and this is really really not inspiring but you know opening up to a popularizing way of history listening to the others and trying to understand what kind of arguments and experiences are there and both examples i was giving to you actually work and in a sense uh, this is really encouraging dem kann ich mich um, in wenigen Worten I can only subscribe to that um, there is a risk me included that you fall into a routine uh, we injure up uh, the, uh, the liberal foundations of uh, the, the foundations of liberal democracy and are not um, uh, capable of further developing this and, and the uh, attractive uh, development would go, would need to go in the direction, uh, like Andrea was was uh, uh, mentioning that you rethink new media role. And as an academic, uh, one should use. Uh, I mean, within the community, we are, uh, I think, somehow uh, effective. But uh, where it uh, otherwise it can be effective needs to be rethought. And uh, people like we sitting here, uh, so-called experts, that know it all um, and make, uh, however, this know-how available. And the idea is also that experts should be more uh, moderators than teachers, and we should uh, uh, we should uh, uh, tackle this and embrace that without. Um, uh, but this intent to be uh, fancy, trendy, and sexy uh, uh, is w uh, basically difficult uh, for one because I don't believe it'll work, uh, and it, it would also be against uh, professional uh, uh, convictions. Uh, thanks for this concluding thoughts, and now I would like to open up the floor. Uh, is there microphones? Please use microphones. We can't translate this. A question to Ms. Kovac. What I don't understand, uh, uh, the uprising from uh, 56 is called a revolution. Uh, um, all trades could be mentioned through which uh, the term revolution is defined. But look at the Afri American, the Russian, the French revolution. But uh, then they see what happened in Hungary in 
in 56 was the Nagy Rakoshi line to Kada that was an internal communist affair. And you can't possibly use the uh, term revolution. One tried to do that in, in Germany to call the 17th of June a revolution, but this won't wash. Uh, and uh, would would uh, make the term revolution null and void. My question to you, is that your private opinion? Or are there historians or are there politicians in Hungary which uh, also uh, view this popular rising uh, and call it a revolution also? I would like to collect a couple of uh, uh, questions, if, if I may. Okay, let's get more. I have three questions to the panelists. First, the um, fight for um, for who's right here. Yeah. Two terms uh, have not been uh, used, uh, uh, home and homeland and patriotism. Th these right-wing populist movements uh, occupy these, this terminology. Uh, but this is something that is from the, the, the uh, from the center of the society here also, and uh, under Peto, the role of the historians. Uh, female historians are somehow an international community, and there are reward system. Uh, the, um, uh, when a new chair uh, is uh, appointed, it's about internationality, uh, uh, etc. Uh, associate professors. Uh, uh, have these rules of the community been uh, null and void? I cannot uh, imagine that with the positions that you have presented there, uh, you can be successful internationally, at least in other parts of the world. Um, uh, and thirdly, is there a new difference uh, between post-communist and Western uh, democratic uh, states? I think there are some arguments, some motives, um, uh, which uh, there is a, a, a difference. A, a difference we, we need to be talking about uh, this afternoon. Uh, I mean, Germany and Austria are follow-up states of the Nazi regime, and there is a significant difference between these countries and other countries, but in terms of history policy and history conscience, it's not about the competition of uh, victims, but it is also about heroes, competition of heroes. And and uh, Western narrative is the post-heroic narrative. Um, We can no longer befriend ourselves with that concept of a hero, and what I view to be an interesting development. Nur gewissen was die Praxis dieser. And uh, we see that practice of this history policy, but also the theoretic um, dealing with that Western model, uh, uh, meaning uh, criticism of that shame culture. Uh, I only know that from the Polish debate so far. Um, so, and linking to that. <laughs> What Eva and, and Andrea were saying, that classic constellation of our generation fighting for a history vision against a hegemonial culture, aren't we? And I'm only talking about Austria. Maybe in Germany it's not different. Aren't we at the threshold of a generation where, where that generation of men uh, of memory which goes into retirement and a new generation comes uh, for which doesn't know how they shape memory, how they get in, into uh, responsible positions. Sorry for all these questions. Um, thanks to the panelists. Um, one question on the, the, the point whether the panel uh, agrees too much among themselves. Uh, shouldn't we have invited Eva Maria Schmitz? Uh, and the question derived from that is, in how far is there a dialogue possible between historians? Uh, because it's not about consensus in a democracy, but rather 
uh, about exchanging arguments rationally. Is there still a perfect? You have decided, we have decided against it because Ms. Schmidt is not on the podium. Um, we don't want to export these fights that you have in Hungary or in Poland and revisit uh, them. But uh, have this perspective in, in Hungary, um, should we also have these debates uh, in, in Germany, uh, cross border, so to speak? And another question, Joachim von Puttgam uh, hinted towards comparisons. Well, uh, right wing populist uh, um, narratives. Do they learn from one another? Uh, when in Hungary they do such a museum, do they look at Poland, Polish example? Is or is that the parallel ways everybody knows one another, or is that uh, putting something in scene where you rather look at, at uh, American museums and link that to your own narrative? So, in, in how far do they observe one another and emulate one another? I guess would be the question very much for the questions and uh, uh, thank you for the translator who is heroically trying to follow it with limited success. <laughs> I have to say. Um, so uh, I think this is really a key question, if dialogue is at all possible. And uh, uh, I would like to bring in the terminology of Chantal Mouffe, who is differentiating between agonistic and antagonistic discussion. So. Uh, you have got you know, a personal strategy and a theoretical position. My personal strategy, if I'm invited to the Veritas Institute, for example, to give a talk, I go. Because you know, I present my kind of uh, firm position and I'm happy to get into a, a dialogue, uh, which doesn't mean that I will move an inch, <laughs> but at least I'm interested what the others are actually saying. So uh, this kind of differentiation between agonistic and antagonistic fight is actually very useful uh, because you don't really need to kill your enemy, right? But try to be open and try to discuss uh, uh, this um, uh, discussion. Um, I'm not sure that I understood from the translation what you were actually saying, but um, uh, I would like to bring in one example, which is uh, from my research interviewing perpetrators and families of perpetrators uh, in Hungary as far as this generational uh, discussion is concerned. And unfortunately, what I found is exactly the same what was described here in Germany. So this East-West distinction, I'm not sure is really relevant. What is relevant, and I'm sorry to refer to this, this concept of bitter experience. So this bitter experience is a European and global experience. This is the dark legacy, which is there in the global context. And when you are asking if there is an international know-how, of course there is an international know-how. And that opens up a possibility for lots of paranoic and uh, co interpretation looking for conspiracy theories. But if we are looking beyond this conspiracy theory, uh, we see that uh, recently there is this uh, very uh, fruitful discussion uh, analyzing the 1920s as a kind of analogy of the present times, uh, looking at how actually the different uh, networks, institutions uh, distributed certain ideas and know-hows and toolkit in the 1920s and 30s and later on how actually Nazi Germany used different cultural institutions and newspapers and intellectuals to, to, uh, to disseminate ideas. And you see the same phenomenon, the same toolkit uh, here. And in that context, I agree with Eva that the toolkit is basically the same. But what is new here is actually the content of that toolkit. It is sexy and cool to be exclusionary and racist nowadays. The second which is new is that there is uh, in, there is, who, who are the good guys, right? Uh, 
and this is actually a new phenomenon uh, that if you look at what's happening in the US now, uh, if you look at what's happening in Britain, so the uh, kind of um, ambiguity about you know what is good, what is accept acceptable, where is the red line, what you should not uh, pass. And the third one is the infrastructure. And let me stress that this securitization, the militarization in Central Europe, it's not only in Poland, it's everywhere, and it's not only in Eastern Europe, but also uh, in Bulgaria, in Macedonia, you see that there are these paramilitary organizations which are actually um, taking over the weakening position of the state. There is a very good article by Veronika Grzebalska in the conversations about the uh, militarization of Central Europe as a, um, uh, as a, as a phenomenon. So uh, what I would like to argue again, that this is something new, and we have to really think about conceptually, epistemologically, and also professionally, because you are saying that you are, you know, it's against your professional uh, credo. Uh, on the other hand, our profession is diminishing, the state is not giving money. I'm sitting on the advisory board of the Horizon 2020 in Brussels, and I see the struggle how, you know, for humanities and social sciences, we are trying to lobby some money. Please, please don't take it away. So this is really a, a hegemonic fight, and I don't know how long you can actually stick to your professional credo because uh, uh, this kind of um, uh, um, new in this paradigm change, actually, the profession as such is basically questioned. So in the, in the polypore, you know, there is no space for a uh, kind of uh, 19th century type of uh, objective professional position. Ich werde kurzer sein, also Revolution. Um, es gibt ein Institut. Uh well, there is an institute that has uh, that name that uh, is for the uh, is it 56 revolution. And that was a very democratic discussion since 88, I think, since 1988 and 89, i.e. that uh, discussion about the uh, 56 um, the revolution. And that was a uh, basic discussion in the democratization process. That's why it remained uh, such, uh, and um, there's lots of controversies of how you can narrate that history of that revolution. Uh, and, and of course, it is an extremely complex uh, point in uh, uh, Hungary in history. And uh, in, uh, not even this uh, government could uh, um, occupy this ground. Uh, uh, so it is a problem still for the elites as well as the other political actors um, uh, to integrate this revolution into their narratives because it was so multifaceted uh, and uh, because it was also a short period. <laughs> as I was saying at the beginning, um, yes, there's not much uh, uh, Dissents here on the on the on the panel. Andrea um, started with it and uh, closed her presentation with it. Uh, for her, it's a fight for a hegemonial political position uh, on all levels. Among us historians, there has been a continuous uh, fight which uh, narrative is more plausible, which uh, narrative can be sold as uh, sexy and, narrative, uh, and, and, and attractive. And uh, it is also a fight in the political elite. You could also call it a cultural uh, clash. We have been knowing this for, for 200 years. We so you fight on a European level. Um, so it so happened that the uh, remembrance culture was uh, Europeanized, and, uh, and the history that we witnessed uh, that uh, is our experience. Uh, were viewed to be the task of European integration, and then, um, and then you have these national versions of history, and 
and says that I'm a victim. Of course, I will repeat uh, uh, the, 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 the Holocaust uh, 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 story, but I want to have my victimhood presented on that same level, so we have to understand this fight. Teil der Geschichte und Teil der So that part of this he hegemonial discourse in Europe, uh, the, I think East-West uh, uh, still works because East and West have different histories. Uh, the, the Eastern uh, uh, societies have, have witnessed a different uh, history, really. Yeah, uh, the Frage der Revolution is that the right begriff. Um, The question whether it's a revolution or not, I mean, is a revolution not a revolution if it stopped right from the beginning? In 1956, in Hungary, it was rather clear that there was a certain crisis management which uh, triggered a certain appeasement, and Khrushchev was right in what he saw. So there was a revolutionary component, no doubt, and yet. Eva is also right. It's part of the political debate. And the question is, is it a liberation struggle, or is it a revolution, or is it the revolt of a people, Volksaufstand, for example? And is it rather progressive in a social context, in a societal context, or in a national context? I mean, that's a question which is important in the Hungarian context, because that question was asked also with respect to 1948-49. The nationalistic attitude as a radicalization of the progressive a mood is certainly also what we need to see in this context. Whether there is a major difference with respect to post-communist countries, between post-communist countries, sorry, for example, with respect to Poland, I think it's about the fundamental understanding of history. Volker Knigge said that we try to reduce our certainties when dealing with history, i.e., we enhance our uncertainty in dealing with history in spite of the fact that we try to ascertain ourselves or find certainty and in spite of the fact that we have to deal with painful memories. Now, you might go and say, this is your typical post-heroic attitude, but you find it all over the place, not only in the follower states of the Third Reich. And the right-wing populist ideas in post-communist countries have many more fans than in the West. But there are two sides. There is also the self-critical, enlightened attitude of those who want to adopt a critical stance with respect to their history. They are to be found in the East, too. So we need to differentiate. In West, in the in doppelte Besatzung gibt es doch nicht. Wir haben eine Frage hinten noch. Sie haben sich noch gemeldet, wenn es there is one more question, maybe two. I have an emotional question. Pause ist äh, mit dieser Spaltung der Gesellschaft. Ähm, haben die Ungarn nicht das Problem? Well. The Hungarians had to solve a problem 
which accompanied them already in the last century, i.e. they were always at the side of the losers. And their immediate neighbors fought at the side of the fascists, and they were winners, the Romanians, for example. So I do see a kind of minority complex in Hungary, which is moving on and which still exists and which makes people say, well, damn it, I want to be one of the winners once in my life, too. Orban's speech, which is being quoted, I mean, he, he, he tries to mention things which are positive in the time, and people go and try to find these positive elements. And they say, well, OK, you see that down at the roots, the Hungarians are strong and powerful. So wouldn't that be an aspect to consider, the fact that they were always winners? And then what about the tragic weakness of the post-communist government in Hungary, in Hungary? I mean, they tried all political parties, and they tried to find a government which would get Hungary on the winner street. And now, once again, they fear to be losers because things don't work the way they should in order to make them winners. That was just a comment, actually. Markus Meckel, I wasn't here at the beginning, so if I ask something you have talked about, you just skipped my question. But I wanted to ask something concerning the graves of the soldiers of uh, World War II. I used to be the president of the German Association for the Care of War Graves. And I tried to have people not only think about German soldiers who died, but also of what these soldiers did abroad. I failed with my approach, at least in the association whose president I was. But the overall attitude was a rather alien one in Hungary, too. There is the ministry in charge of the graves of the soldiers. And from what I see, the ministry or those who represent the ministry are not involved in the discourse, i.e. they take care of the graves of the dead who are heroes who died for their fatherland, no matter what the political context were. But um, historical studies don't take place here. Am I right? Now, when I say at home, I mean my country. I don't mean my, my apartment, my house, of course. And I mean, this was not about establishing a consensus with respect to how to interpret certain historical epochs. But there are certain red lines, if you ask me. and. We need to determine these lines and define them together. And we need to consider the experiences of different people, and it's difficult. Maybe an answer from you to the last question. I think that um, uh, there is a lot about the post 89 transformation and also how those promises uh, were actually 
betrayed by the neoliberal uh, transformation. And in a sense, you see that values are getting more and more important. So your question actually points towards the direction that what are those consensual values which should be driving the society? And uh, uh, in this context, what is important is that on the progressive side, on the left, there are very few values what, which can come forward and uh, which can be followed and which can actually drive certain um, political and memorialization uh, processes. The best example for this is um, uh, the memorialization of Anna Ketli. Some of you who are working on the international social democratic movement, uh, she was um, uh, uh, the serving in the Hungarian parliament in the interwar period. Two of them were there. And after uh, 45, uh, she was also prisoned as a social democrat who was anti-communist. Um, uh, uh, in 56, uh, uh, she uh, went to exile uh, and tried to organize the, uh, the anti-communist um, resistance. Guess which party was inaugurating a statue for Anna Ketli, who is a woman, a social democrat, widely known. It was the Fidesz party. So in a sense, I think this really shows that we, re we have to reconsider and rethink what kind of values are there and what are the, uh, what are the possibilities for finding that red line. Because I think that is really the question, because the red line, what we see now, is moving right towards the far right. And uh, when we think the progressives have a problem, uh, the conservatives also have a problem because the uh, kind of illiberal state is not a conservative state. And sometimes we inflate these two uh, states, but they are, you know, they don't behave as conservative states do. And as far as the German soldiers are concerned, in, all over in uh, Eastern Europe, the, the memory of the um, of the German um, uh, soldiers is, um, uh, uh, is is really one of the hot topics of uh, memory politics. And interestingly enough, in the Hungarian context, in my research, which is the uh, sexual violence during wartime, what I find is that there is this interesting comparison happening that how the German soldiers were not raping in Hungary, why the Red Army was raping in Hungary, and how actually this debate, which is a very widely use debate um, uh, is actually contributing to the anti-Russian sentiment and also uh, as such and also creating again the uh, Hungarian victimhood. I would like to intervene. I need to intervene. Mr. Meckel, why don't you get an answer together with the coffee? Because there's going to be a coffee break now. And thank you for being patient. And thank you for having gotten up early uh, in order to join us here.